You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. At Consumer Cellular, you get the same exact coverage as the largest carriers, but for up to half the cost. Same thing, up to half the cost. Up to half the cost for the same thing. 50% the money for 100% the same thing. I hope I'm making myself clear. Consumer Cellular. When freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. Half the cost savings based on cost of Consumer Cellular single-line 5 gigabyte data plan with unlimited talk and text compared to lowest cost single-line postpaid unlimited talk text and data plan offered by T-Mobile and Verizon May 2023. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweet. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 183. This is our second episode on the Paris Peace Conference. Last time we discussed the American and French delegations to Paris and outlined some of their main desires for the discussions at the conference. This episode we will start off by looking at the British delegation and its leader David Lloyd George. Then we will take our first crack at discussing the overall organization of the Supreme Council, which would initially be made up of British, American, French, Japanese, and Italian leaders. They would be the ones that would make many of the big decisions that would find their way into the Treaty of Versailles. And so we need to discuss how the council was organized, how the members of the council got along, how they determined the topics to discuss, and then how they made their decisions. This is very important information, because many of our episodes will revolve around the actions and decisions of the Supreme Council. They would quite literally have the fate of the world in their hands. In the last part of this episode, we will take a deep dive into one specific topic around the conference, self-determination. The concept of self-determination would play a huge role in Wilson's views of the post-war world, and almost more importantly, it had become an important aspect of what many groups of people around Europe thought Wilson wanted to assert at the conference. There was just one problem. Self-determination was not actually mentioned in the 14 points, where Wilson sort of outlined a post-war world. And more importantly, Wilson had not really taken the time to firmly define what he meant by the concept when he did discuss it. You may be thinking that defining self-determination is easy. Pop open Google, bam, you can find it. But the textbook definition of self-determination and how self-determination was actually defined and implemented at the conference are two different things. Why that was the case and how it would drive many of the decisions made by the Supreme Council will be two questions that this episode will seek to answer. We start today with the British, and just as it is impossible to discuss the French without discussing Clemenceau or the Americans and Wilson, it is equally impossible to discuss the British without first discussing David Lloyd George. Lloyd George had been the Prime Minister since December 1916, and he would lead British, the British delegation in 1918. He would have the luxury of a good base of support, at least initially, after the elections in late 1918 had went quite well for his coalition. In his personal views, Lloyd George seems to have been much more moderate than some of the other leaders at the conference. These views were present earlier in the war, and they remained present when the war was over. But he was a seasoned politician, and he knew how to play the game. With so many other leaders taking more extreme views, Lloyd George was willing to compromise on just about anything. Lloyd George's politicking would begin almost as soon as the war was over, and one example of this would be where he stood when compared with the French and Americans. The British and Lloyd George had worked very closely with the French throughout the war, but when it came time for peace, the British would closely align themselves with Wilson and the Americans, rather than Clemenceau and the French, although there were a few important pieces of American policy that the British were entirely against. 
One view that Lloyd George would share with Wilson was the idea that the conference was at risk of causing animosity in Germany that would continue into the future. And the views that the French and their push for a proper punishment of Germany was only going to make it worse. He would write during the conference that, quote, Beyond question, it was a disaster that we had laid Germany prostrate before we could reach a peace settlement. Had Ludendorff retreated earlier to strong lines within the German frontier and there held out against us, a peace settlement might have been reached that contained fewer roots of bitterness that one d- than one dictated to a foe who, even in defeat, clung with his claws to the foreign lands he had invaded and devastated and in the process of liberating his hold increased the desolation. Unhappily for the peace of the world, the hostile armies were still on the soil of France and Belgium when the end came, and the surrender had to be complete enough to guarantee the aims for which we fought. End quote. So in that quote, uh, Lloyd George is sort of bringing up the idea that the post-war settlement would have actually been better if Germany was actually stronger. Whereas uh, a lot of modern-day commentators will compare World War I, of course, to World War II, where the Germans were very much weaker after the settlement as the path forward for what would have been a better peace settlement. Lloyd George here, sort of contemporarily with the events, is taking the opposite view. I feel like now is a good time to bring up, not for the first or last time, the hypocrisy with which the British would push their view of moderation around the treatment of Germany. While they were pushing for moderation in one area, often involving a loud criticism of the French, their greed in non-European matters was almost insatiable. In the Middle East, Africa, and the Far East, they would push for the greatest possible gains, no matter what. When it came time to determine exactly who would represent the British Empire at the conference, there was almost immediate complications. One of the complicating factors was how the British Commonwealth in India would be represented in Paris. Should they have their own voting representatives, or would they just fall under the British umbrella? Initially, Lloyd George and others in London did not want them to have their own representatives, but the push both from around the world and from others in the British government was just too strong, and eventually Lloyd George was forced to allow these representatives from around the world. Eventually, the following setup was agreed upon. One of the five main British delegates, which would have voting rights at the conference, would be chosen from the empire, and then each of the dominions in India would also have their own votes. As soon as this system was suggested, other countries became very concerned about the arrangement. There was concern among the French and Americans, or really just about anybody, that all of these voting members from the empire would give the British unbelievable power to craft the settlement in whatever way they wanted. In some ways, this is exactly what happened, but not all the time. For example, it gave the British a lot of power when it came to matters that did not directly concern the dominions in India. So for decisions about the Balkans or Eastern Europe, you know, Australia and New Zealand is probably just going to follow London's lead. However, in other areas where the dominions in India were directly impacted, they were far more likely to go their own way. With all of these members around... uh, from around the globe, and those from the home isles, the British delegation in Paris would include well over 400 individuals, once officials, advisors, clerks, and other supporting personnel were accounted for. They would set themselves up in five hotels in Paris, taking over the entire building in each one, and they posted guards from Scotland Yard at the front doors. The British would take security very seriously during the conference. They would operate their own postal service to make sure nobody was snooping on their mail. And all British delegate members were required to wear passes with their photographs on them at all times. Much like in France and the United States, the situation on the home front in Britain would also influence the course of the discussions in Paris. In his work, Great Britain, the Home Front, Eric Goldstein breaks up the feelings in Britain into three distinct phases. The first was in the last two months of 1918, when the government was preparing for the 1918 general election. This election was called because Lloyd George believed that he would win, and win big, and with that win he would cement his legitimacy as the leader of the British negotiations. During this time, British official policy pretty much just pandered to the public and what they wanted to hear. The second phase would be from the end of the elections until about mid-April 1919, and during this time Lloyd George was concerned that the direction of the treaty was going to be at odds with what people back home and members of his own government expected. 
The third phase would be the final months of the conference, where Lloyd George felt more secure in his power and more optimistic about the conference moving towards a more moderate final settlement. Throughout this entire process, there would always be a disconnect between what the people back home wanted and the reality that the British delegation was dealing with. Overall, the population of Britain generally had unrealistic expectations for the peace, both in terms of how quickly and easily it would be arrived at, but also how beneficial it would be for British society. An example of where Lloyd George would see this as a problem would be around reparations. He would take a very moderate stance on reparations, taking something of a middle ground between the French and Americans. He knew that the British public would hang a lot of emphasis on the reparations, if only because it was sort of the easiest part of the settlement to understand. It would be a number. It's pretty, but it's also pretty easy to misinterpret a number. Lloyd George would argue that no matter what the number was that was finally in the treaty for reparations, no matter how large, it would still result in, quote, many people in England as well as in France, they will exclaim, it is too small. The problem with reparations and the expectations for them was echoed by others within the government, with Lord Blake saying, quote, It is also true that no prime minister could have survived a day if he had submitted to the House of Commons as a final figure for reparations even the highest sum that was actually within Germany's power to pay. Because of the impossibility of satisfying both the British public and the Allies, while also trying to craft a, a real peace settlement, Lloyd George would try to find the middle ground. This is by no means the only example of societal expectations interacting and in many ways harming the abilities of those in Paris to create a lasting and impactful peace. This was just one of the problems that the British delegation would deal with during their time at the conference. The Irish Civil War would be brewing, there would be industrial strikes across the country, there were serious concerns about a socialist uprising. All of these post-war issues in Britain would affect the British goals and actions in Paris. We now move on to our discussion of the Supreme Council. One of the important topics to discuss for the conference is the relationship between the leaders of all of the countries involved. They had generally been united during the war, but afterwards huge differences of opinion would develop. And throughout the conference there would be many disagreements between the Allied leaders, but there were a few items that could be agreed upon pretty easily before the conference began. The first was that the best course of action, suggested by Clemenceau to the British and Americans, was for the Allies to come together, figure out their peace terms, and then present it to the Germans. This is actually the origins of the Paris Peace Conference, just a meeting between Allies to hash out the terms that would be given to their enemies. The second item was that the large number of delegates that would be present in Paris would be far too large of a number to make any actual progress, and so the larger countries should figure out what they wanted amongst themselves, and then they would present that to the wider conference. This was the origin of the Supreme Council, which we'll dig into very shortly. When these concepts were discussed and agreed upon by Wilson, Lloyd George, and Clemenceau, there was a general opinion that these discussions would take, at most, a few weeks, and then they would invite the Germans, and the treaty would be signed, and they'd be done, you know, pretty quickly. As with many other features of the conference, this was an incredibly optimistic point of view, and in fact it would take months for the Allies to come to an agreement, and that is just counting from the official start of the conference. Weeks before the conference began, the leaders of the delegations began de facto negotiations when they began to play some political games. Clemenceau would begin to build up relations with Wilson, expressing his strong support for the League of Nations. Lloyd George would do the same, beginning a concerted effort to charm Wilson and to make sure that Wilson believed that Lloyd George and all the British were strongly on his side wherever he was going. Lloyd George would arrive in Paris on January 11th, and on January 12th, 1919, he would meet with the other members of what would come to be called the Supreme Council, Clemenceau, Wilson, the Japanese, and Italian Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando. This would be the primary driver of all of the decisions made at the conference. They would make decisions that would quite literally decide the fate of nations and affect millions of people all over the world. Rarely in the history of the world, at least to my knowledge, have such a small group of individuals held more power than these five members of the Supreme Council. They would meet at least once a day, sometimes twice, sometimes three times, but pretty rarely, and really any time that the council members or their representatives were in Paris. These meetings would always occur without a set agenda, and they would deal with issues as they presented themselves. 
During the first week of meetings, many important administrative decisions were made. Conversations within the council will be held mostly in English, since Clemenceau spoke it well, and Italian Foreign Minister Sonino uh, spoke it well enough to translate. It was also decided that the official languages of the conference should be English and French. This seems like a small decision, but it was discussed at length, since the French wanted the conference to only be recorded and conducted in French, but they would eventually be voted down in favor of bilingual conferences. After these kinds of decisions were made, the real routine developed for the council. This mostly revolved around providing an audience for representatives of all the various nations at the conference. During these audiences, the delegates would discuss what their countries wanted and why, desires that often conflicted with desires of other nations in the region. Then the council would discuss the situation, sometimes creating committees to dig deeper and provide a recommendation, and then they would move on to the next topic. From one day to the next, these audiences and discussions could vary wildly. They might discuss Czechoslovakia one day, then China the next, then South America the next. In March, there was a change to the council, and the Japanese were removed, and most of the foreign ministers were no longer allowed to be in the room. The reason for this change was that they had to get the discussions down to even fewer people, and they just wanted the four leaders, Lloyd George, Clemenceau, Wilson, and Orlando, with maybe some secretaries present just to write things down. This streamlined both the discussions and the decision-making process, just by sheer process of elimination of people and viewpoints. They had to do this because they weren't getting anything done. So that's the general setup for the Supreme Council, and their discussions and actions will be the primary drivers for our narratives in these episodes. I do want to give you my opinions on their actions right up front, just so you sort of know where I'm coming from in these future episodes. So first of all, obviously, the Supreme Council would make some serious mistakes. Huge, lasting, incredibly impactful mistakes. However, I believe that one of their largest mistakes was actually not any of those. Not, none of those later decisions, but instead right at the beginning. And that was the mistake of not realizing that what they wanted to do and the task that they were setting upon themselves was simply impossible. They were tasking themselves with remaking the Western world and seriously changing the entire world. And either through hubris or naivety, they actually believed that they could do this, and what would come out the other side would be better. This would be their greatest and foundational mistake. All the others just spooled off of the belief that they could fix the world. But here's the biggest spoiler I can give for the next 15 episodes. They couldn't fix the world. And what would become readily apparent is that they could barely understand what was broken in the first place. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Thank you.
With those sort of questions being asked, you probably could and probably should be asking why these leaders were put in such positions of power. Now, part of this is the power of their nations, military and economic power, sort of world standing, but part of it is also just reputation and prestige. What would rapidly become clear as the conference unfolded was that these countries were not in a position to force anybody to do anything, and their decisions relied heavily on people just going along with them on the implementation of those decisions. One of the problems that they would face was trying to implement those decisions where this compliance was not present, because already in early 1919, they were all beginning to rapidly demobilize their armies, and their citizens were strongly against more fighting. This presented the council with a problem. As countries throughout history and even into the modern day have learned, real power requires the will, ability, and desire to actually use it. This created two realities in many parts of the world in 1919 and 1920, especially in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. There was one reality that was created in Paris, where the Big Four would bring out their maps and create nations or destroy them, or move borders and settle territorial disputes, and then there was the actual reality in those areas, which sometimes, but not always, aligned with the decisions made in Paris. This will be a big topic of conversation for us when it comes to how the conference handles the Middle East, especially Turkey, and Eastern Europe, especially Russia. It created situations not just of the conference making decisions that were impractical or even impossible, but also creating situations where groups and countries were incredibly disappointed because of the decisions made by the conference that were not carried out, really hurting the reputation and prestige of the conference as a whole. This disappointment would be a theme of, for example, Chinese involvement with the conference. While the will and ability to project power to implement their decisions was a problem for the council, there was also a huge problem when it came to finding out the actual situation in some of the far-flung areas around the world that they were being called upon to make decisions about. Trying to solve, for example, a border dispute between Czechoslovakia and Poland would prove to be a huge challenge, especially when the exact situation in that region was unknown to those in Paris due to the chaos created by the war. There was also just a general lack of knowledge among those making decisions and those that they trusted to advise them. Oftentimes they might just look at some old maps and then hear some delegations from Poland and Czechoslovakia, which rarely brought the same story, and then decide what to do. The one thing that the council could do, and which they would often do, was send out commissions to study the region and then report back on their findings. The efficacy of these commissions varied wildly. They were often just as ignorant of the actual situation as the leaders, and even if they made an effort to physically go to the area, that often did not provide a better understanding. Also, I just want to point this out. The exact geography of all of Europe from the west to the east was often not the strong suit of the people making the decisions at the conference, and when so many decisions that were being made revolved around territorial questions, this was a big problem. In his work, A World Remade, G.J. Meyer points out one example of this phenomenon. In one of their meetings, Wilson apparently just agreed that Italy should extend their border north to the Brenner Pass. He obviously did not have any idea exactly where the Brenner Pass was or the demographics of the region, because it meant a quarter of a million Germans would be placed under Italian control. This went directly against his views of self-determination, but without a better grounding in some of the nitty-gritty details of European geography and demography, these types of mistakes would be frequently made. I just want to point out that Wilson was definitely not the only person making these kind of mistakes. I also just want to point out that in many of these territorial disputes, there wasn't actually a correct answer. I'm not necessarily criticizing the leaders because they didn't get, you know, the multiple choice answer correct, because there often wasn't one that would be acceptable to everyone in the region and then at the conference as well. To find a solution to any of them, let alone all of them, would have required a level of knowledge, time, negotiation, skill, and nuance that was often not present at the conference or in the Treaty of Versailles, or the various treaties that were signed afterwards. Perfect answers were not impossible, just very improbable. And so the council can be mostly excused for not finding those perfect answers. But good answers were often possible, and sometimes they just weren't found. So that is a good introduction to the Supreme Council. Don't worry, you will be hearing a lot more about them. I would be shocked if we go a single episode without talking about their actions, their meetings, their decisions.
But now we sort of shift gears, and we are going to spend the rest of this episode discussing not events, but more concepts. Because when Wilson came to Europe, he brought a few concepts with him that would shape the negotiations for the entirety of the conference. Some, one of these was open diplomacy, or open covenants openly arrived at, which was pretty self-explanatory. Basically, no secret treaties should be allowed, and of course, the laundry list of secret treaties that the Allies had signed during the war, well, hopefully they were in the past. This was a pretty easy concept to understand, but the second two are more challenging. The first was the idea that the nations of the world should redefine how they created peace at the end of conflicts. They should leave reparations, indemnities, territorial acquisitions, all of those things that had been part of post-war treaties for millennia in the past. Instead, they should seek to create a peace without victory, a concept I discussed in good detail in the episodes about the United States coming into the war. But don't worry, that concept will get its own time in the sun in later episodes of this series. Instead, I want to talk about another of Wilson's big concepts, and that's the idea of national determination or self-determination. The term self-determination does not actually appear in the 14 points, but its, but its concept does, and many groups of people all over the world would attach themselves to the idea and really push for its implementation. Many of these groups would point to what Wilson says about Poland in the 13th point as their example. So here's the 13th point of the 14 points, in total. Quote, an independent Polish state should be erected, which should include the territories inhabited by indisputably Polish populations, which should be assured a free and secure access to the sea, and whose political and economic independence and territorial integrity should be guaranteed by international covenant. End quote. Uh, just as a note, I'll be using Poland as my example while we discuss this idea, but the concept could and would be applied to many groups of people all over the world by simply substituting out Polish for any other ethnicity or nationality. So originally, Wilson liked to discuss this concept about self-government, of governments created by the people, for the people, and letting people choose their own government. These ideas sound sort of stereotypically American. In February 1918, he did clarify a little bit more about what he thought should be done specifically around these ideas, saying that they should be satisfied, by, but only satisfied, without, quote, introducing new or perpetrating old elements of discord and antagonism that would be likely in time to break the peace of Europe and consequently of the world, end quote. This idea is pretty easy in abstract. Oh yeah, we want people to be able to freely form their own governments that represent them and form their own nations as well. That sounds great. A world safe for democracy and, and all that. But when it becomes time to actually implement these concepts, you have to really start defining things. What precisely is a well-defined national aspiration? What are the qualities that make it well-defined? And who decides if a national aspiration meets those requirements. There's also other problems, even if you get past that issue. From the text of the 13th point, which I just read, it talks about indisputably Polish population. So is that like a percentage of the people being Polish, a simple majority, or is it more like a state of mind? These would be the questions that many people would be asking during the conference, and it would not just be the Europeans. The leaders of the American mission that was sent to Vienna to try and figure out what was happening in Eastern Europe would have some of these same concerns, and they would repeatedly send messages to Paris asking for clarifications. Robert Lansing, the U.S. Secretary of State, would be running many of these same things as well. He would write, quote, When the president talks about self-determination, what unit has he in mind? Does he mean a race, a territorial area, or a community? It will raise hopes which can never be satisfied. It will, I fear, cost thousands of lives. In the end, it is bound to be discredited, to be called the dream of an idealist who failed to realize the danger until it was too late to check those who attempt to put the principle into force. I don't think I can more clearly state the problems with trying to implement this self-determination than Lansing does in that quote. This may not have been a huge problem at the conference if it was clear that it only applied to certain groups. But others wanted to be included in it as well, and many of those groups would attach themselves to the idea and then be disappointed when it wasn't given to them. And in many cases, the British and French really wished those groups would not do that. 
There were many peoples that the powers of Europe really wanted to keep away from ideas like self-determination, or phrases like autonomous development, or the right of those who submit to authority to have a voice in their own governments, which were phrases that Wilson would also sometimes use to describe this idea. When these concepts started to be discussed at the conference, red flags started going up in the largest institutions that denied groups of people all over the world a proper voice in their own government. It's a small thing you may have heard of, colonialism, and the biggest red flags would be in London and Paris. These concerns caused many conversations about who precisely these concepts should be applied to, and what precisely a well-defined nationality was. Could it be applied to the Polish people? Uh, absolutely. But could a nationality be subdivided? So could the Polish Catholics and the Polish Protestants be lumped under the same umbrella, or should they be asked if they wanted to separate? What about an extremely well-developed nationalist cause in Ireland? Well, British would really hope you would not discuss that. Closer to Paris, what about the people in Alsace-Lorraine, who had for two generations been a part of Germany? What if they did not want to be a part of France? What about the Slovaks, whose territory and sovereignty had been surrendered to the desires of the Czechs? Or the various Slavic peoples, who would soon be a part of Yugoslavia, controlled almost entirely by the Serbians? I phrase all of these as questions because they would all be asked over the course of the conference. The answer that would be arrived at was to institute a sort of controlled blindness. The leaders at Versailles picked those ethnicities and nationalities that they wanted to, and they were given control. So the New Poland would contain many non-Polish people on the periphery, including the Danzig Corridor, which was almost entirely German. These types of actions were often taken for legitimate reasons, in the case of Danzig, providing Poland with access to the sea, but that does not mean that they were well received by those whose fate was being decided without allowing them any input. These types of decisions were not limited to the Danzig Corridor or on the topic of Poland. It was not enough to decide that certain groups needed countries of their own and then to create rough outlines of where those countries would be. Actual borders had to be determined, or the conference was just dooming those countries to war with their neighbors. And in no geographical area was this process of border creation more fraught with problems than in Eastern Europe. In that area, there were multiple competing claims, not just for the land of vanquished nations, which were often ignored, but also for nations on the Allied side. The Poles and the Czechs had both been promised their own countries after the war, but Poland and Czechoslovakia would share a border, so where precisely should it be drawn? On that border would be a mix of Polish and Czech people who had intermingled over time, and both of these new countries would look to history to try and make their claims. Historical claims is a tricky subject, and one not limited to Eastern Europe. Alsace-Lorraine is an example of a recent historical claim, but in many places of the world for most of history, borders have been pretty fluid, especially if you look at the long time span of history. So when discussing historical borders, they first had to determine which historical border, and for some nations, those claims would date back hundreds of years. The presence of Germans in and around these territories would be a complicating factor, and there would be arguments from both sides around how many of them should be included in these new countries. Some Americans of the Czechoslovak Commission would say, quote, If all the territories inhabited by the Germans of Bohemia were separated from Czechoslovakia, this separation would cause a great danger for the Czechoslovak state, as well as serious difficulties for the Germans themselves. The only possible solution is, therefore, to attach them to Czechoslovakia. When making many of these decisions, there was also a strong mix of racism running around the conference. Here is Lloyd George in what would later be called the Fontainebleau Memorandum. Quote, I cannot conceive a greater cause of future war than that of the German people, who have certainly proved themselves one of the most vigorous and powerful races in the world, that they should be surrounded by a small number of small states, many of them consisting of people who have never previously set up a stable government for themselves, but each of them containing large masses of Germans, clamoring for reunion with their native land. The proposal of the Polish Commission that we should place 2.1 million Germans under the control of a people which has never proved its capacity for stable self-government throughout history must, in my judgment, lead sooner or later to a new war in the east of Europe. Lloyd George is basically saying that the Poles, as a people, are too weak to control having German citizens. Those Germans will just be too vigorous and powerful for them. 
I also like how Lloyd George takes a little dig at the polls here by saying that they've never proved their capacity for stable self-government, which just sort of brushes the actions of external powers who are actively trying to subvert that self-government under the rug and forgets about them. Of course, the prophetic nature of the Fontainebleau Memorandum cannot be ignored, given the actions of Germany in the late 30s around Czechoslovakia and Poland and Austria, but that doesn't mean that it's not full of problematic sentiments. To close out this episode, I want to remind everyone that while I have used Poland as an example throughout the latter half of this episode, these concepts and similar actions and basically the same problems would be present for many of the countries at the conference. When we vis visit each region of Europe, we will revisit this conversation almost every time as the conference and the Supreme Council tries to grapple with competing claims for territory and who deserves to be a nation. I wanted to get an overview of this topic out of the way up front and to introduce all of these questions and concerns, because next episode we will spend most of our time talking about the construct that Wilson believed could resolve any of these problems, or any problems created by the Treaty of Versailles, the League of Nations. This international organization was his big answer to the world's big problems, and he considered it his most important contribution to the Paris Peace Conference. I hope you will join me next episode as we talk about this idea.